I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only Standing in the sun, I can only imagine when all I would do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine, yeah. I can only imagine. To my knees, will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine, yeah. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for your cheer?
Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Zach's family and um, the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, we thank you for being here. Uh, we are so blessed. The family has been blown away by the support of the community, and so we thank you for your presence here. Uh, we are a few minutes away from beginning. Uh, the family is here. Uh, we have had a few private moments to, uh, to reflect and to remember Zach. Before we begin the formal ceremonies, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Craig Smith. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor at Mission Hills Church, which is Zach and Gracie's church. And I'll be your master of ceremonies today. Uh, for the friends, family, neighbors, and community members joining us both here and via media outlets, we want you to, to know that you're an important part of the ceremony today, and we're very glad that you're here. This may be your first law enforcement service, and so I'd like to give you a brief overview of what's to come today. Uh, this is a law enforcement ceremony, and it is steeped with traditions and honors. Many of these traditions come directly from military services where remembrances and honor are bestowed upon those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for their community and the country. Throughout the service, you will see a number of different activities taking place. Each one is a ritual with its own significance. Just know that each piece of the service is based on the wishes of the fallen deputy and his family. It also follows the traditions of our law enforcement profession. The Honor Guard Commander will be giving preparatory commands for standing, sitting, and saluting at key points. When requested to stand, everyone may rise. All uniform personnel are requested to stand at attention. For your participation, uniformed personnel will display a military-style hand salute when the command present arms is given. Non-uniformed personnel or community members may place their hand over their heart. Salutes are to be held until the order arms has been given by the honor guard. The service will begin in a few minutes. Thank you.
And uh, you can be seated right now. You didn't hear the first part, did you? So now you don't know who I am. Uh, with talking, be as I welcome you, and before we say the prayer, um, I was talking with Grace this morning, and I wanted to sort of set the stage of what we're about to hear and do and see and and reflect on as we honor Deputy Zach Parrish. Sunday morning, I was on my way to the hospital, and my Sergeant Chris Washburn called me on the phone and said, you're no longer going to the hospital, you're going to Zach's house. And I immediately knew that bad got worse. And as we entered your house, the very first thing I saw was an inscription on your wall. I picked up on that immediately. And it said, Lord, I cannot, but you can. And I stared at that, and I looked at Chris, and he was staring at it. And a scripture came to mind for you, Grace, from 1 Corinthians 16, 6. Perhaps I will stay with you, even spend winters, so that you can, Lord, help me on my journey. And so, as we are here, I know that uh, on Sunday, not only Grace and her family and her girls, their world changed. But as you look around, Grace, you see that that world changed not only for every person in this room, but for every person, law enforcement across this country. And so as we hold you up today, we are honoring a man that is an amazing person. I've had people ask me all week, how do you do this? And all I can tell you is I do it the same way that Zach and Grace do. Lord, I can't, but you can. Will you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. And as much as it doesn't feel any better, Lord, because Zach's not with us here physically, we do rejoice that he is there with you, looking into your eyes. We thank you that he's been a light on this earth and proclaiming righteousness and justice. And he is willing, as many in this room, to stand in the way of harm, to do what's right, to go forward and not backwards. And so, Lord, we ask that you would be glorified today. That's the one thing grace wants, is for you to be glorified. And so we ask that you would just, your presence, your power, your peace, your strength, would minister to each individual in this place because, Lord, I know, God, each person is thinking something different. They're feeling something different. But, Lord, we know that you are still the comforter for each person who cries out to you. So we ask that you be with us, and we pray for this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. My name is Rick Derbyshire. I'm one of the chaplains for Littleton Police Department and Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. And it has been one of my high privileges to be one of Zach's pastors at Mission Hills Church. Zach and Gracie are people of faith. I'd like to read some scriptures that they are very familiar with. The first is from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me to the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Another passage from the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul writes about what happens when a believer dies. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. 
We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. One last passage. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he told his followers that he was going to leave them. And they were very troubled by that. And so Jesus said this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's, <clears throat> in my father's house are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a, place, prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me where I am. You know the place where I'm going. And Thomas said, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Those are words that Zach greatly believed in.
Zach and I sing that song to our girls every night. It's very special to us. I've written many letters to Zach. Some were love notes while we dated. Some were letters tucked inside of his suitcase when he traveled. Others were emails that I'd write to him when my words couldn't seem to make the cut. They were often filled with dreams, words of affirmation, and encouragement. But sometimes they followed an argument where I was just too mad to talk and I needed him to understand where I stood. Letters have always been a way for me to process and express my heart, so it only felt right to compose this final letter to the love of my life. This is a letter that I never thought I'd write. It is one filled with grief and sorrow, pain and heartache, but it is also filled with pride and joy. Joy for the amazing 10 years I had with him and pride for the man he was. It's a letter that I hope my girls can read one day and feel every ounce of love I have for their daddy. I want them to know him as the amazing father and husband that he was, but I also want them to know his passion for his career and desire to serve and protect. He loved his job. As soon as he was sworn in, his blood turned blue, so in turn, mine did too. So to the, my hero and the love of my life, you are my once in a lifetime. You are my hero and my best friend. You gave me a life of adventure and love. You can make me laugh so hard my cheeks would hurt. I'll never forget slow dancing with you in the kitchen or the way you'd hold my hand. You challenged me, encouraged me, held me accountable, and pushed me to be a better human being every day. Watching you hold our newborn baby girls and weep over them will forever be etched in my heart. I never thought I'd feel more pride than when I saw you as a daddy. Babe, you were an amazing father and loved your girls so well. I promise to raise our girls with the Lord as my focus. I promise to raise them in a home that bleeds blue. I promise to teach them to kick a soccer ball, have a love for music, and the outdoors. I promise that I will not teach them to drive when they turn 16 and instead get your brothers in blue to do the job. <laughs> I promise to tell them every day that their daddy loved them to the moon. You, my love, are my hero. I am honored that you chose me to be your bride eight and a half years ago. And knowing what I know now, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. You are my rock, my heart, and my soulmate, and I am so proud of you. I will honor you and celebrate you with every fiber of my being for the rest of my life. So save a seat in heaven for me and meet me at the gates when the Lord calls me home. I can't wait to be held by you again. Oh, my love, forever and always. Good morning. I'll come at this from a different perspective from Gracie. He was my son. He actually was my buddy, and I was a daddy. What I want to tell you this morning, I want to say thank you. Our family, we are heartbroken, and we're grieving, and we're hurting,
but we could not do it without you. Family and friends are in front of me. I know you've come from many, many places. And I thank you. Men and women of blue, our motto is going to be, go blue, live like Zach. I thank you to Castle Rock family. And I thank you to the Douglas County family. I've never seen the love that I've seen with the love of blue. And I may wear blue for the rest of my career in banking, and they always have to get over it. But my wife would tell you most of my things in the, in the closet are already blue. So I guess I'm prepared to do that. People ask us, how are you doing this? How am you doing this? It is because we're clinging to our faith, the light of Jesus Christ. And our hope is in him. I want to read, I'm going to read a verse, and then I'm going to read a life verse, because Zach also had a life verse. People ask me sometimes, what's that mean? It means something that God lays on your heart, and it's something that's etched there. You'll hear about Zach's later. But I'm going to share mine with you right now. It's Psalms 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted above the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. And Zach's life verse was Joshua 1.9. Joshua As I was preparing for this, um, I was awoken in the middle of the night, and Gracie knows this. I couldn't sleep. And that night, I felt like Zach was present. He said, Dad, it is going to be okay. Please sleep. Please rest and know that I'm okay. So I found this scripture, and uh, one of my son-in-laws said, Dad, you know you're really good if you just wait to the last minute. It's got to be God-ordained. And I think I was working on this right before we got in the Mordecai. So it's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It's the second letter that Paul is writing to the Corinthians at the church. Paul had really made them want to affirm in their faith and know who Jesus was. But this spoke to my heart and spoke to our family's heart. And he said to me, this is 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. So with that, I thought I would try to tell a few stories about Zach. And I think if you know us and know him and know Gracie, he can make everyone laugh. So it's not out of respect that we may laugh. It's out of loving him because he's probably looking at me like, what in the world are you doing? And as Gracie and I were trying to pray last night, and I was praying with her, and I thought she hung up on me. The phone dropped, and I'm like, Gracie, are you there? I didn't know what happened. She says, no, I think Zach was just kind of messing with us because we were trying to have a, a quiet moment. So a little bit about Zach. Uh, he was born in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we moved a lot, and I think that helped him be prepared to uh, see all types of people. Um, and uh, he was born Zachary Spurlock Parrish III, named after me. I was favorably known as ZP2 and ZP3. And um, he, uh, he, was, he was my three and my two, and I know he, had a, he, has, a, he has a two here that used, they used to call me one and two in uh, Castle Rock. But... Um, he was born, born there, and we moved to Atlanta, Georgia, Roanoke, Virginia, Vienna, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, Houston, and he moved here in Colorado in 2009. You know, he enjoyed life. He never met a stranger. Uh, he loved on people and made friends wherever he went. Our first name, Zachary, is God Remembered. That's what it stands for. As I reflect on his life, a few stories came to mind. I was thinking about... Uh, all of his energy that he had when he was little, and he was about Caroline's age, about four, and he loved water sprinklers. He loved to run through water sprinklers, and I think he did it for about two hours. And even uh, as much as he did it, he was, Dad, i got to keep going, i got to keep going. And that's who, uh, the zest of life that he had. And I think about birthday parties, and Chris reminded me of a birthday party. She remember when he turned six and we were at Chuck E. Cheese? And i got to tell you, that was a big deal for him because at four he was deathly afraid of Chuck E. Cheese. He would scream bloody murder. That big mouse came to him. So if you think he's all brave and mighty and big, he was scared of a stuffed mouse. So, uh, but he, he went to each one of those boys and thanked them for 
their gift one by one and I'd forgotten about it and Chris said he's always had that heart of thankfulness for friendship and then I think about baseball um, this bat uh, he and I was we were connected with baseball I can't tell you how many trips we made how many travel trips we made but one came to mind so I think most of you that have served uh, next to him and family knows when something was put on his mind you couldn't stop him we were at Vero Beach at the uh, uh, Dodgers spring training. And there was one of those booths, you know, where you, like, you know what your pitch is, you can win. Well, Zach had a fastball at a 10 years old that was 52 miles an hour consistently. He knew it. So eight helmets in that he'd already won. The guy comes up to me and said, how many does he want? I said, I don't know, let me ask him. So I asked him, he goes, Dad, I've got 10 buddies at home and I'm winning 10 helmets. So with 10, the guy left, it was only a dollar each, so I gave him another 20 because I felt really bad. And then he had to buy another suitcase to get all the helmets home. Uh, but I, I have that fond memory that he enjoyed life. He enjoyed life. And the reason why he enjoyed life, he's had Jesus living, living in his heart. That bat that you see on stage is one that when we were here the last time, I said, why in the world are you keeping that bat? Do you remember me, Gracie, asking him that? So that bat that's on stage represents a time that a team that he was on in North Carolina, we went to Cooperstown and they won the championship. And he had to have an engraved bat. And at the time I thought, good grief, I can't believe I'm buying something that will probably, will never, use or see again and just helps me to know that the bat's here and um, he loved baseball. He loved his family and we loved him. I got to hold him when he was born. I got to hold him many times and cry with him and somebody asked me about that scar on his right eyebrow that's so prominent today in the picture uh, that happened at 14 months old on Mother's Day he decides that he can fall down some marble st stairs and be okay and he was fine and we got to the hospital we had to tie him down with a papoose patch to keep him on the bed he was trying to get out so uh, that's what that is but one of my favorite things about him and about life, most of the people from Houston know that he um, had a lot of girls that he liked. And, um, but I will tell you something that happened. I love the story because Gracie kind of told him, eh. and I think you got your number by listening to you giving a number to another guy. And uh, he uh, did that, and uh, he calls me. And Grace, I don't know if you know what he told me. But he said, Dad, I've met the most beautiful girl that I've ever seen, and I think she's the one. And I said, wait a minute, you've only had two dates with her. He goes, I'm telling you, she's the one. And so we knew she was the one because... Uh, our family started by Claire used antibacterial and Zach would not get it on his hands and he goes well I started using antibacterial because Claire because Gracie told me I didn't need to use it so we knew she was going to be family and um, the most beautiful thing that happened with this marriage is that we have a second family I told Tim and Michelle and Lauren and Bobby that I would not have shared his life with any other family. The minute we met you. And so I thank you for loving on him and accepting him as family. He loved music. Um, those of you from Houston know he played on high school and at some point he decided he wasn't going to play baseball. And that guitar represents a time that he made a transition in his life. And last night, some people that were here knew that I was looking for the treasures that I hope were still in that guitar box. Uh, he wrote music. He wrote music. Beautiful music. 
He sung to Gracie. He said that's what really clinched her was the music, but we don't know. Maybe it was the black Mustang that he drove. We won't know. But he, lo he loved music, and I, I was weeping because I remember him singing those songs, and he loved music. Michelle was telling me it was too quiet. He had to have music on, so um, that song was special to Gracie, and all the songs you hear were. But I want to tell you he loved his role as a policeman. He loved it. You know, I was telling uh, the sheriff and his wife last night that I used to dread to get a call from Zach when he's in corporate America. He tried to be a banker like me, and I didn't know why. But anyway, he tried to be a banker and said, I can't stand it. And every time I get a call, he uh, would tell me, I'd talk him off the ledge. Tim, I think you remember those times, too. But once he became a policeman, he was like a new man. He was in his element. He was called to serve. He was called to serve. He loved his job. I don't know if this person's here today or not, but if she is, thank you for allowing yourself to be interviewed. Um, and I want to share this story with you. I don't know her. Some of you may have seen the video. Uh, Zach pulled her over a year and a half ago for DUI. And as soon as he got off work, he called me and said, Dad, you won't believe what just happened. I pulled a woman over. She's a DUI. I had to arrest her. She got an 18-month-old child. And as he did a lot with me early in the morning, he says, we need to pray for her. We need to pray for her. And the story doesn't end here because she got pulled over by him again for a broken taillight this time, thankfully. And she was able to share the story that her life had been changed. She had quit drinking. And that's who he was. He wanted people to be changed. And he called me all excited. And Gracie knows when he's excited, he would get all animated. Dad, I can't, I, I, I can't believe what happened. I pulled her over. Tell light was broke this time. She's not drinking anymore. So those are the fun times for me. And I know all of us have had those moments with him when he was excited about his job. But the most important part of his life I want to share with you is his faith. Zach knew the Christmas story. He knew there was a fallen world, and he knew that God had to come to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. He also knew that he was a sinful man, and he had sins that needed to be forgiven, and he understood the cross, the cross that Jesus died, God's only son died to shed his blood for life eternal. But he understood the Easter story, the Easter story of resurrection. That is our hope eternal. My prayer today is that you will listen attentively to a message that Mike's going to bring. Because it being glory to Zach's name and honor to Zach's claim, but to the Lord, that if you changed your life where you could have the light of the love that our son carried. I would like us to end in prayer for me. And as we do as a family, I'd like you to join hands with whomever's next to you. Men in blue, it's okay to hold hands with other men in blue. <laughs> Father, this is the hardest thing I have ever had to do. Lord, I am praying that through this, your Holy Spirit will rain down on this family to give us peace and comfort that we will not be able to understand. And I pray for the men and women in blue and all that serve in this congregation that are sitting here hearing me, Lord, that you will put a hedge of protection upon them. But I pray them, they too, live in a dark place. I pray that your light will be part of them as they leave here today, Lord. I thank you for Gracie. I thank you for Caroline. And I thank you for Evie. And I pray a special prayer for them right now. Surround them, Lord. Love them. Give Gracie the strength and the power to continue. We will miss Zach. And we give you praise that he's with you, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Troy Kessler, and I was Zach's best friend. A number of years ago, I started praying to God for a strong male friendship. I had friends and acquaintances, but no one close enough to really walk through life with in a way where we could shoot the breeze and have fun, but also where we could talk about anything and be there for each other through life's difficult times. I prayed for months, and before I even started praying, God had the exact person in mind. In uh, 2012, I joined a small group uh, at the church, uh, and this is where I first met Zach and Gracie. Zach and I hit it off right away and uh, started talking, and we decided to work out together before work. This was before either of us was in law enforcement where we were both working in areas of finance. Um, among the many conversations we had at the gym, even before the sun would rise, we talked about everything or anything and everything, including our future career goals. And I mentioned that I'd been interested in getting into law enforcement. At that time, Zach wanted to promote up into the business banking world and had thoughts of going back to school to get his MBA. <clears throat> Zach told me at one point that he'd always had a desire to be in law enforcement, but did not seem to think it was possible. The subject of law enforcement kept coming up in our workouts, and one day he called me after an interview for a business banking position. He told me the interview went great, and they offered him the job right away, but when they started telling him the details of the job specifically. I remember him mentioning the ridiculous amounts of cold calling he had to do. He immediately realized this was not what he wanted for his life. He turned down the job. In our phone conversation, he said, Troy, I'm not doing this anymore. It's not what God wants and it's not what I want. If I make a decision to change careers, I need to do it now. He asked me to pray for the difficult change uh, that it would bring to his family and the many obstacles ahead. Zach did not waste time at all. He never wasted time when he knew what he wanted. He talked with Gracie and received her support. He applied and was accepted into Arapahoe Community College uh, post program. And for months, Zach worked full time and attended long night classes and weekend classes and excelled as he achieved his post-certification. At the same time, I'd been accepted into the Colorado State Patrol and was going through the academy. It was really awesome to be able to start our law enforcement careers at the same time, knowing that we both felt led into them by God. You've all heard about what an awesome officer Zach was, um, but I want to tell you the kind of friend he was to me. When working out regularly together, um, or when working out regularly together, became difficult due, hard, due to our different schedules. We still made time on a regular basis to hang out. I can hear Zach calling me now, telling me that he misses my face, how he needed to see me soon. People would tease me about my bromance with Zach, and he and my wife Jen would tease each other about who was really number one. He constantly talked about Gracie and his girls, how much he loved them, and at times how he struggled to love them how they deserved. We talked about our personal walks with the Lord, and many times we both struggled to spend time with him regularly and lead our families the way we should. We encouraged each other in everything. I can, I can still and will never forget him validating where I was at but then saying, I encourage you to, and fill in the blank there. Zach was intentional about making sure he wasn't in the spotlight and always took the opportunity to ask me about my life. I know he had the same intentionality with many of you as well. Zach and I had a common love for people and wanted others to know this love came from Jesus. It did not matter what we did, as long as we did it together. 
When we got distracted by things of this world, we relied on one another to reel each other back in. Zach would tell me that when he had a short fuse or was wired or quick to anger after a long week at work, Gracie would tell him he needed some Troy time. Zach and Gracie, or Zach said Gracie told him he was much more even keel and chilled out after we hung out. And it was my honor and joy to be there for Zach in this way. For those of you who knew Zach, he could have sold anything. He found something he loved, and it was phenomenal. And he wanted to share it. He wanted you to share in it too. A good pre-workout or a protein, phenomenal. A chicken quesadilla with Chick-fil-A sauce, phenomenal. A Nissan Titan 4X Pro, phenomenal. Then when he got his F-150 just a few months later, phenomenal. As you've heard about Zach, he loved the adrenaline rush and the thrill in life. Just last year, after years of trying to persuade me into skydiving, with him I finally gave in. Jumping from a perfectly good airplane at 18,000 feet with my best friend, phenomenal. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, and in case you didn't know, all those phenomenal things, as Zach said, would change your life. He always wanted me to come to Castle Rock PD and uh, shortly after Douglas County, he wanted me to come there too. And I wanted him to come to state. It would have been a blast. Zach had been trying to persuade me for years to buy a house next door to him. In their most recent home, there's a house across the street for sale. And he told me to buy the house on numerous occasions. Um, we daydreamed about building a tunnel from one house to the other. <laughs> and. Uh, being able to see each other more often. <laughs> Zach was a man I always admired and looked up to. Zach loved the Lord. He was a man that loved his wife and his daughters with his whole heart. They were the loves of his life and they were his priorities. He had such a self-awareness and seemed to have an answer for everything. And when he didn't, he found it. When he was wrong, he was humble enough to admit it. He had the courage to admit when he was hurting or stressed or felt like a complete jerk for messing something up when it affected someone. Zach had a courage, strength, passion, commitment, desire, and love I have never witnessed before. Zach had a way of addressing difficult issues and having difficult conversations with people, speaking out of love and understanding. Zach would never allow, allow me to get down on myself and would stop me right in my tracks if I did and tell me to shut my mouth. <laughs> then he gently and lovingly told me why I was wrong. I'm sure many of you have experienced these attributes in Zach. Here's another one. He was appreciative and thankful, as ZP2 said. After you met Zach uh, or helped him in some fashion, not only would he tell you in person he appreciated you, he always followed up with a text or email, no matter how trivial your contribution was. Jesus said in the book of Luke, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Zach epitomized these attributes of God. When I think of Zach, I see a man that resembles Christ. He was genuine and passionate. He loved the Lord, he loved others, and he especially loved Gracie. As Christians, we're commanded to love our wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And Zach did anything for the love of Gracie Lou, as he called her. He was always intentional and present. He loved the life God blessed him with, and he loved the people God surrounded him with. When I think of what happened five days ago, I'm angry and I'm heartbroken, knowing I lost my best friend. I also rest in the fact that Zach gave his life responding to God's call. And I rest in the knowledge that 
All of heaven rejoiced when he arrived in the presence of the one true God. I can't wait to get to heaven. I imagine Jesus and Zach walking up to me. I can hear Zach say, Troy, where have you been my whole life? I miss your face. Lord, thank you for the, your gift of Zach, his presence and impact on the lives of everyone who knew him. And Zach, you've sold me. I want a house next door to you in heaven with a tunnel in between. Until we meet again, I love you, brother. I'll miss seeing your face. Hello, my name is Jack Colley, and I'm the chief of police in Castle Rock. As a chief, people often ask me, what keeps you up at night? And what keeps me up at night is the phone call that I received Sunday morning. I was told four Douglas County deputies have been shot. And my heart sunk. But the voice on the other side of the phone said, well, there's more. I was like, okay, what is it? One of those deputies was Zach Parrish. And I, my heart just sunk. Because you see, just seven months ago, Zach was at our agency as a police officer. He had served with us for two and a half years. Chiefs of police are looking for officers that are genuine and authentic, are compassionate, caring, and have a passion for serving people. That was Zach Parrish. December 22nd, 2014. That was the day that I met Zach. It was the chief's interview, which is the last step in the hiring process. And I'll never forget it. Zach walks in with his big wide smile. He gives me this firm handshake. He was so excited to be there. And I was thinking, this, this is going to be a great interview. Um, during the interview, I found out a few things about Zach pretty quickly. One, he was a man of faith. Two, he loved his family. And three, it took me a little bit longer to get to. And that was, why did he want to transition from banking and finance to law enforcement because it seemed a little odd to me. That's not the typical applicant we have come in. But as his best friend just said, just said, Zach sold me. He was good at sales. I'm pretty sure he would have made a lot of money doing that. <laughs> but there was no doubt in my mind when we were done with that interview that there had been some type of magnet force that was pulling Zach to law enforcement that there was no doubt in my mind that he was passionate about it. It wasn't just on a whim that he decided to do this. It was a calling for Zach. And that was very evident to me. For the two and a half years that Zach worked for the Castle Rock Police Department. He brought such enthusiasm to our department. He impacted everybody in our department. And the way that he served people was very unique. 
He had such a passion. He had such a way of treating everybody as they were a part of his family, no matter what the situation was. Whether he was at a coffee shop and just happened to talk to somebody, whether he had stopped somebody on a traffic stop, or whether he was helping somebody on their worst day. As we all know, Zach had a great sense of humor and he had this special way of connecting and finding a way to calm people down, to make them feel at ease. That was a special gift that Zach had. Zach was the type of officer that once he held a young child in his arms to shield them from seeing handcuffs being placed on their parent. He once stopped an individual for speeding, just a typical traffic stop. As he's walking up to the car, the driver says, Officer, I just want to let you know, I have a concealed carry permit and I have a firearm on me. Now, classic Zach, he doesn't skip a beat and says, okay, I'll tell you what, you don't move yours, I won't move mine, and we get a deal. So he sold him on that one too. Um, I mean, that was just Zach. He, he used humor in a situation like that to, to make that driver feel at ease about what he had just told Zach and took a what could have been a tense situation and de-escalated it. One, on one occasion, Zach came across a individual who was kind of down on his luck. And Zach, I don't know if he told you this, Gracie, but <laughs> Zach pulled money out of his wallet and paid for a hotel room for this individual so that they could have a safe, warm place to stay for the evening. That was Zach. He did have an incredible work ethic. There's no doubt about that. Zach found a way to squeeze 11 hours of work into a 10-hour shift every single day. And as I learned at, learned at the vigil, I now know why my overtime budget was over for the last couple of years, but that was Zach. He was always working to the last second because that's what his passion was. He understood that as you serve people one by one, that that collectively makes a difference to the community that you're protecting and serving. And as a chief, we all know, as police officers, we all know how important it is to earn the trust of the public that we serve. And Zach did that every single day. Zach had a tremendous impact on our entire department. That enthusiasm that he brought with him, his humor, his knack of connecting with people, he spread that out throughout our whole department. He was the officer who took the lead in putting together a fundraiser for a police officer's wife that was battling cancer. He was the officer who stepped forward to console an officer who had lost a family member. He was the officer who would organize gatherings after work so that his teammates can all come together and decompress and have fun and have some laughs after a hard night's work. And we all know that Zach liked to work out. I would uh, sometimes see him in the gym working out with some of his friends, one of them was part of a duel that we affectionately call the Wonder Twins. Current officer, Matt Fellows, that's here today. Those guys would work out and Zach would say, hey, you know, Chief, do you mind if I put some music on? And I was like, no, I don't have a problem with that. I, I'm good with it. And you're right, he did like music. Um, I just didn't know how loud he liked it. <laughs> I was kind of thinking he might put on the Doobie Brothers, but he was playing something I'd never heard of before. Um, but it did, 
it was, that was just who he was. It was a lot of fun to, uh, to spend time with him. Zach lived life to the fullest, whether it was with his family, how he approached his faith, having fun, and working. Everything he did pegged the meter 100%. And I think that's what one thing we'll always take away from Zach and learn. So I'll go back to, as a chief, who we're looking for. Someone who's genuine, empathetic, caring, can serve people, has a passion for it. Zach embodied all of those characteristics. Zach served our department with honor and dignity. And when we lost Zach, we lost a role model police officer. We were all blessed to have known Zach. Our department was blessed to have the ability to work with him. And Gracie, we are so thankful that you shared him with us for the time that he was with us. I know this for sure. There's no doubt in my mind. Zach will forever watch over us and give us the strength as law enforcement officers to serve our communities every single day because that's Zach, who Zach was. And as we march forward to serve together, Zach will give us the strength to do the best as we possibly can. Zach, my brother, rest in peace. Hello, I'm uh, Tony Spurlock, the Douglas County Sheriff. I am, want to thank every one of you for being here and honoring Deputy Zach Parrish. The Douglas County Sheriff's Office is hurting. The community is hurting. But no more than his family. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I've learned a lot about Zach Parrish in the last five days by spending time with his family and then some fellow officers. Tim was um, very um, clear and passionate in his statements to me that Zach loved and because he was passionate, charismatic, and very protective, that he always knew that his girls would be safe. And I had just a brief opportunity to talk to Michelle a little bit about how proud she was of him. And I could see in their eyes this pain that you don't see often. And I got the chance to spend time with ZP2. And uh, that was a, a great opportunity to hear from a man who said, my son was going to be a great banker. But he chose to be part of helping save this world. And when I was sharing with him what happened to Zach, we were having conversation back and forth. And he, as a polite man, and as a polite banker, he kept calling the suspect a suspect, probably because I was doing that. And he stopped and kind of put his hand up and he says, you know, I can't call that person a suspect anymore. 
he killed my son. He didn't say a foul word. He didn't call him anything else. He just bowed his head for a moment. And I know he was praying. And he was sorry and sad. I first met Chris at the vigil. And she came, actually I was quite a distance away from her and she came right over and put her arms right around me. I had no idea who she was. Um, and when my wife and I were spending time with her, I was walking out and I said, she, she's your mother. Um, she has this southern accent and this southern mother love. And it was so clear of that when she would talk about the love of her son. And she said, you know what? I am comforted in knowing that Zach died doing exactly what he loved to do. And I would never want him to spend a hundred years on this earth doing something he didn't like. To hear those things from parents and family members who very well could have been angry and very well could have been cursing and damning us for taking him. She didn't. She just got up and she just hugged me. And she said, thank you. Thank you for allowing Zach to have that period of time of the most passionate love for his career that he could ever have. And I had talked to some folks and when I talked to Gracie, um, I had only met Gracie twice. I met her the day that we swore Zach in and it was happy and full of joy and future and love. And the second time I met Gracie was at the hospital. And I held her hand. She didn't look away from me. She put her hand right over mine. And I told her, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we've lost Zach. And there's no doubt in my mind she was shocked and in shock. She had people around her. But she just held on to my hand. She kept squeezing my hand. She says, it's going to be okay. Zach loved his job. And I was taken back by that. I had no idea what to expect. And if you've talked to Gracie in his last five days, I bet she said it eight million times. Um, she knew Jack, uh, that Zach had a love for Jesus Christ. And she knew that everything was going to be all right. I was heartwarmed when I found out that she went to visit and called the other injured officers to talk to their loved ones. This is a wife of a police officer who was just killed in the line of duty. And she was reaching out to everyone else. And yeah, we saw her cry. But I kept seeing her get up. And she kept saying, I'm very proud of my husband. And I'd have gone in that building with him. She spoke about the love that he had for his two girls. And it was clear. You can see it in the pictures. You can see it in their home. And it was obvious that there was a love there that was undeniably larger than anything in life. When I, we finished the, the time that we had with the families, I had brought my wife with me because, quite frankly, I, I don't know what it's like to 
be a spouse of a police officer. And um, my wife and I left both of the meetings that we had with the family. And she says, isn't it comfortable being with them? And she got home and she called her mother and said, these are, these are wonderful people. We felt loved by them, comforted by them. And when we went into this, we had no idea what was going to happen. And I have to know this to be true, that they were worried about what I felt. They were concerned about me and my office and the members of the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. They put themselves first. And as I learned more about Zach and his life, and I, I'm thankful and I'm, I'm appreciative, Jack, that you raised him those two and a half years. Um, and you gave him to us very well trained. Um, I mentioned that I was sure that it was a rouge to hit my overtime budget. Um, because he was exactly the same here. Um, he, he didn't want to go away from that. He was brave and courageous and caring. And not afraid to be funny when it was appropriate. Not afraid to talk. He had a thirst to know and to learn. And that was about everything. All of Zach's cops always wanted to work with him. I learned some thing at the, a number of things at the candlelight vigil that scared me. Um, so, so wherever Graves B is at, I need to talk to you later. But the officers would come up and speak and say, we would change shifts so we could work with Zach. And then we would work another shift. I, I let that go because I don't, I don't think we're supposed to do that. Um, and, and, and this was a continuing message all the time about his partners and the people that wanted to be with Zach. They wanted to be a part of him. And I want to tell you a little bit about a very short period of time in life, five days ago, when Zach did the same thing that he did every time he served the people. He went to a disturbance call. He found out what was going on. He determined there was no crime, and he encouraged everyone, quiet down. It's three o'clock in the morning. Zach got called back again around 5.17 in the morning. And this was different. And Zach knew it was different. And he put together a plan with his fellow officers that worked the adjoining districts. And I got a chance to listen to the body cam audio tapes. Never once did I hear Zach Parrish use a foul word. Never once did I hear him raise his voice. Never once did I hear him be derogatory to this individual. Not one time. Now I know why officers wanted to work with Zach Parrish. Of course it was Zach's call and I'm guessing those of you who worked with Zach knew that if it was his call, you stood behind him, never in front of him. And that's who he was. And up until the moments that Deputy Zach Parrish died, he was pleading with the man, begging him, let me talk to you. Let me help you. Please. And then the killer 
killed him. And Zach wouldn't have had it any other way. I know that by just listening to the audio tape. I'd never heard a more calm voice ever in a call like that. And it reminds me of 1 Corinthians. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. And that was Deputy Zach Parrish. I'm going to do a couple things for Zach. Zach Parrish is going to be awarded the Medal of Valor for his courage and his bravery. And Zach would have been like this, for those of you who know him. Okay. But I know something else he wanted. And Gracie shared it with us. I talked to his father about it this morning. Because he was so driven, he put little sticky notes all around the house to remind him to exercise, um, to do this, that, and the other. And then the final thing was, eat fruit. Um, I heard from the, the SWAT operators in Douglas County, and we were blessed in Douglas County. The Douglas County Regional SWAT team is comprised of men and women from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, the Parker Police Department, the Lone Tree Police Department, and the Castle Rock Police Department. And those men and women come together to serve the greater Douglas County area every day. And so I've directed that a position on the roster will be forever held for Deputy Zach Parrish as an operator of the Douglas County Regional SWAT team. I've been a deputy for 34 years. I've been a sheriff for three years. I've never had to bury a fellow officer under my command. I never had to feel that hole in my heart. It's sad that Zach is gone. But it's up to us to remember him and to be like him. And as Chief Colley said, if he could have a hundred of Zachs, he'd give me 50 of them. I am, I'm trying to be like Zach. I, I talked to my wife, I said, I, I'm mad. I'm mad and there's things I wanna say. I wanna strike out. And I did strike out on this page. And then I had the pleasure of riding for an hour with his parents. And I got into this church and I scratched it out. He doesn't want his boss to be mad. He wants his boss to be loving and caring and share what Zach loved and cared about. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm always going to do. And I ask all of us to be Zach, to be Deputy Zach Parrish. The men and women who were with him that morning are hurting as well. Deputy Jeff Pelly is still in the hospital. We're recovering well. Deputy Mike Doyle is with us. Deputy Taylor Dalis Davis is with us. Sergeant Dave Byer was here as his leader. And Castle Rock Police Officer Tom O'Donnell, who was shot while he was trying to rescue Zach. All of them respected him. All of them would have done anything for him. And all of them would have fought to be in front of him. I'm proud of Deputy Zach Parrish. He truly was a cop's cop. And he didn't even know what that was. He just knew that he had something in him. And everyone around him knew that he had it. And they just wanted to follow him. I too will be like Zach Parrish. 
Deputy Parrish, God bless you. May God bless you and keep you and forever rest in peace. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll,
Well, my name is Mike Romberger, and I had the privilege of being the pastor of the church where Zach and Gracie went to until a few years ago when I left, and also a pastor of the Molenpah family. And uh, on behalf of my wife, Jane, and our whole family, I want to tell all of you how much we love you and how sorry we are for this loss. Of Zach. Gracie, I remember your wedding well. I had uh, not just a front row seat, I was right next to you and Zach. The pictures reminded me once again what a beautiful day it was. It was not very far away from here. It was just up on the hill at the sanctuary, the golf club there, overlooking this amazing, beautiful uh, landscape behind it. I remember when you were standing there and a massive gust of wind came up and knocked the veil off of your head and right into your dad's face and literally plastered there by how hard the wind was. And I don't know if it was just from the Lord that your dad didn't want to see you get married or something, but <laughs> that was a fun day. I remember um, the reception. I remember how fun it was. I remember the, the, the laughter, the Clinging of, the, clinging of the glasses so you guys would kiss over and over again throughout that night. I remember the dancing and, and just the great fun that we all had. It was a wonderful time. And I remember standing there and you and Zach had your hands held tightly to each other and you looked intently into each other's eyes. And with all of your heart, you said these words. You said, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness or in health, to love, honor, and cherish until death do us part. And you did well, and so did he. Today is as tough as a day gets. So let's get some perspective on a day like today. There's a man who 
had everything he could ever want. He was rich. He was powerful. He was full of wisdom. And he went on a binge, if you will, to try to figure out the meaning of life. He, he tried to build things, and he tried women and, and song and, and alcohol. He just tried all the merriments of life to try to understand the meaning of life, and he wrote it down in a book in the Old Testament known as Ecclesiastes. It was Solomon, the great king of Israel. And in that book, he wrote this about the meaning of life. He said, it's better to be in the house of mourning, M-O-U-R-I-N-G. It's better to be in the house of mourning than in the house of feasting. Because in the house of mourning, the living take it to heart. Meaning, better to be at a memorial service than at a party. At a party, you don't really take things to heart. You talk about the Broncos, you talk about the weather, you talk about your latest purchase, you talk about the vacation you just went on, but you don't really grapple with the difficult things of life. But in the house of mourning, you do. So let's do that. Let's take some things to heart. You've already heard so much about Zach. I wrote down just some of my own remembrances of him. Passionate, all in, zest for life, no off switch. Fun, funny, active, strong, caring, compassionate. Uh, baseball, singing, you guys have said it all. Protector of those he loved. I've learned that he even taught his sisters protective moves every time he came home back to Texas. A lover of people, known for his big hugs. Uh, one who could talk to anyone, one who tried to make things right between people. And as you've heard today, Zach was a follower of Jesus. And this allowed him to shape his values and his character and gave him compassion for the hurting and the downtrodden and caused him to pour his life into teenagers at church and made him a great husband and father. In fact, as was mentioned by Chaplain Tim, in their home there are some signs that are up, some placards that talk about their faith. Like right by the dining room table, it says in a placard, the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory to God. And in the kitchen it says, and if he is, and if not he, let me say it again, and if not, he is still good. And if not, he is still good. And as Tim mentioned, Lord, I cannot, but you can. But you can. Zach had a life verse. Some people uh, who love the Bible have a, have a life verse. They choose it, and it's kind of their mantra for their life. He chose Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. It's, it's a context of, of the leadership baton being passed from Moses to Joshua the leaders of, of the nation of Israel, and they're now going to go into the promised land. In the promised land that was promised to them by God are fortified cities and enemies and evil and, and those who want to destroy them and do them harm. And they're going to go into that land and take over that land. And so Joshua is going to be a very much a military leadership presence. And God says to him as he takes this mantle of leadership, and this is Josh, and this is Zach's verse, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What a great verse for law enforcement, right? Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I want to take just a moment, and I think for those of us civilians who are in this place, that we should take a moment and thank those who are brave and strong and courageous, the law enforcement people who are here today. Can we do that for a moment and thank them for their service?
Why be strong? Why be courageous? Because there's evil out there. And evil is real. Evil is real because the devil is real. And he's out to destroy all that is, that is good. Some people, they only believe in God, but they don't believe in the devil. The problem with that is both of them come from the same book. The devil hates God and he doesn't play by the rules. And he wants to destroy. So, so why doesn't God just stop all the evil? Why doesn't he just like, obliterate it? Why, why doesn't he just do away with it? Well, God is a God who wants people to follow him because they want to follow him, not because they're forced to follow him. He wants people to be able to choose to follow him because if you're just following him because you have to, that's not really following, is it? And so he allows people to not follow him. And in so doing, some of those people embrace evil and wickedness and darkness. Listen to these words from Jesus himself, who said in John chapter 3, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, talking about Jesus himself. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. There are people who love the darkness and their deeds are evil. You law enforcement, enforcement personnel know that better than anybody. You live with this threat every day of your life. Now, let's just look back a few verses of what Jesus said from John chapter 3 to get some hope. Because there's hope today. There's hope in this crazy world that we live in. Before he talked about the evil, Jesus talked about the hope of how to overcome this evil. And in a verse that's maybe very familiar to you, he said, in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And here's what Jesus is saying in a nutshell, and I want to make it very personal for each one of you. He's saying, God loves you. God loves you. For God so loved the world, the world, everyone. God is a nonpartisan, non-pious lover of all people, contrary to what some people think of him. He loves you, he loves me, and all those are sitting around you and me. No matter what you have done, he loves you. And his actions are motivated by his love for you. God loves you. God pursues you. He pursues you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Think of that. Zach, Zach was your only son. Tim, you have one son. I have one son. God gave his only son. God is the great initiator. He was proactive in establishing a relationship with us. He gave us Jesus, his son, to make us right with him. He's proactive. One of the great differences of Christianity from other faiths is that it is, it is God reaching out to us, not us reaching out to him. God loves you. He pursues you. And he saves you through his son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever 
believes in him, in his son Jesus, should not perish, but have eternal life. Have eternal life. I was so struck by one of the comments at the vigil the other night at Mission Hills Church when it was said, Zach went on a call to help a guy who killed him. Think of that. Zach went on a call to help a guy who killed him. One of Zach's sisters said to me the other day, if Zach knew he was going to die at that moment, he still would have gone anyway. You see, that's exactly what God did for us. God the Father sent his only son knowing that he was going to die for our good, to save us from our sin so we would be saved. Now I want you to know I've never been saved. You say, what? Meaning I've never been in a real drastic situation where I needed to be saved. I, I've kind of always played it a bit safe. I'm not like Zach. <laughs> The, the greatest example I've had of getting saved is when I was, I was a catamaran once. I was in the Long Beach Harbor, and our catamaran started to go back out to sea, and the Coast Guard came and reached out a pole and pulled us to safety. That's as good as I get in the story. I've never been stuck on a mountaintop in, in the midst of a blizzard, and they had to come get me here in Colorado. I've never, never been in a foreign prison, or prison and, a, and the embassy had to you know, come, come get me. I, I've never been in a situation like that. I, I've always kind of played it safe. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, I, like, I like nice hotels, okay? I, I like all of that. I, I just want to be safe and, and fine. That's what a lot of people do spiritually. They think as long as I play it safe, I'll be fine. I, 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 I won't do the big sins. You know, what, what are the big sins? Well, lately, the big sins are what? Sexual harassment, terrorism, shooting people indiscriminately, mm, cop killing. Those are the really big sins. But if I just kind of keep it just kind of okay, you know, I speed a little bit. A lot of you guys, you never get tickets if you speed anyway. <laughs> Rumor has it. And... Um, <laughs> I'm just going to do a little hanky-panky on the side. I'm just going to have some anger issues. Um, uh, but I'm just going to kind of keep it in, in, in a decent you know, place. It's not going to get out of control. Then I'll be safe. I'll be fine with God. But the problem with that is God is a holy God, and all it takes is one sin of any kind of size. And then we're separated from a holy God. And we need someone to come and save us from our sin. To take upon our sin upon himself because he's perfect, which is Jesus. And on the cross, die for our sin so that we can be made right with God. When we ask for the forgiveness of our sin, he forgives us because he's paid the price for our sin on the cross. Doesn't matter how little sin, how big the sin is, any sin separates us from God. And we can't play it safe. We need someone to save us from our sin. So Jesus says, whoever believes in him will not perish. To believe in him will not perish, will not spend eternity away from him, will not spend eternity in hell. Will not perish if we believe in him, not if we do a bunch of good deeds, not if we give away a lot of money, not if we go to church even, not if we read Christian literature, none of that. It's if we believe. In Jesus, the Son of God. And we will have eternal life, it says. Life eternal with God. Life that never ends. We're going to miss Zach. And we're going to miss him a lot. But his life did not end the other day. Promise you that. In heaven, there will be no more shootings. No more loss of loved ones, no more sexual harassment, no more political strife, no more wars, no more nuclear threat. There will be peace and joy and purpose and love 
and fulfillment and being part of God's family and enjoying the presence of God and hanging out with Zach. That's going to be heaven. Please listen. Please listen. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a God who loves you, pursues you, and has provided a way to save you. That's why today, although it feels like a tragedy, is not completely because Zach is still alive. On Sunday, when Gracie got back to the house, she described to us the procession that went from the hospital, Littleton Hospital, down to the coroner's office in Douglas County. She was telling us about how the freeways had been cleared and how the entourage of, of police cars was, was massive and how literally the freeways were lined with people who were waving and blowing kisses and had tears and on the bridges above were the fire departments with their flags and they were saluting. Today I heard it was all the more. I mean, we got here very early this morning and there were still people camped out like at 8 o'clock with their kids on the side of the road. Why would people do that? Our governor's here today. Thank you for being here, Mr. Governor. Why would he come? Why this outpouring of generosity and love? Why so many people have been touched by this? Why? Because one life matters. One life matters. Your life matters. Zach's life matters. My life matters. Every life matters. Get this. Every life matters to God. So much so that he sent his son Jesus. Your life matters to him. My life matters to him. Zach's life matters to God. And if I may say, even the shooter's life matters to God. And I don't want to be over dramatic, but I want to share the truth today. That none of us know what tomorrow may bring. That's not just a comment to law enforcement, because the last time I looked, there's still a 100% mortality rate going on around here. All right? We're all going to die. And I can promise you that the greatest way you can honor Zach's life is to follow his Lord. I wouldn't do it for Zach. I would do it because you realize that it's God who loves you, God who pursues you, and God has made a way to save you. And all you have to do is believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Ask for the forgiveness of your sin. He will clean you up completely no matter what you have done. No matter what. And he will give you the gift of eternal life. And so, I want to give us, every one of us, an opportunity. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior to do so right now. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'll say the words, but you can do it from your heart. And to receive this incredible gift from this God who loves you so much. That he gave his son. So if you would please bow with me in prayer. You can pray this prayer along with me, just where you are silently, but between you and God. Dear Lord God, thank you for loving me. Just as I am, thank you for loving me. Thank you for pursuing me, even though I haven't pursued you. Thank you for sending your son to die for me so that I can live forever with you. I believe 
that Jesus is the Son of God. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. All of it. To clean me up. To make me new. And I receive your gift of eternal life. And I want to live for you forever. Oh Lord God, that prayer is my guess your favorite prayer. Someone receiving your love to spend eternity with you forever in your family. And Lord, I want to thank you for Zach Parrish's life, for Zest for Life, for his dear family, for Caroline and for Everly. For each family member that's here, Lord, may they be surrounded by your presence and your peace and your love like they've never experienced before. And Lord, we thank you for Zach's life. And we say goodbye. But not forever goodbye. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Corps personnel.
Negative contact all units, stand by for Tom's. This is a final call for Deputy Zachary Parrish, badge number 1721. Deputy Parrish was fatally shot on December 31st, 2017, while answering a call for duty. He gave of himself while serving Douglas County with courage and valor. Men and women of the Sheriff's Office are forever grateful and proud to have served the Deputy Parish. We will never forget his ultimate sacrifice. Deputy Zachary Parish, may you rest in peace knowing that your strength lives on in your wife, your legacy will be carried on through your daughters, and that your honor will continue on with all of us. 1721, you are clear for end of watch. Thank you for your service, and rest easy, sir. We have the watch from here. 1721 is end of watch for the final time. DCSO call sign Paul 163, badge number 1721, is hereby retired. Just back there.
When I got dressed this morning, I put on a tie, which I don't usually do. I wear ties at weddings and funerals, and I, I so wish today were a wedding and not what we're here for. But there's something I do at every wedding that I think is appropriate for you especially, Gracie. At every wedding, there's that moment when the couple stands in front of me as the pastor, and every couple I marry, I ask this question. I say, are you ready for this? And they always say yes. And then I always laugh, and I go, no, you're not. Because you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. And I imagine you know what that feels like right now. But then I say, it's okay. You don't need to know what you're getting yourself into as long as you know the one who does. You don't need to know what's coming as long as you know the one who does, and you do. And I'm so sorry that you have to face this. But Gracie, know that the Jesus who is embracing your husband right now is the same Jesus who is embracing you. Grace, you're going to get through this because Jesus will get you through this. The parish family, you're going to get through this because Jesus will get you through this. The Molenbaugh family, you're going to get through this because Jesus will get you through this. And you are surrounded by friends and family and fellow officers people who love you and they will be the hands and the feet of Jesus to you. We are here for you. You're going to get through this because Jesus will get you through this. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we don't want to be here. Not in this place, not doing this thing today. And yet we know that you, you grieve for this pain as much as we do. Lord, we trust, as we've heard several times over the last five days, that because of Zach's faith in you, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. So, Father, we ask that you would allow us to grieve, but to grieve as those who have hope, and to hope as those who have confidence. Confidence that the one that we commend to your care tonight, we might call him brother, husband, father, son. Lord, we know that this one is to you, child, and that he is in your arms now. And we trust him to you. We release him into your love. Lord Jesus, we ask that you'd pour out your love, your mercy, your grace, and your strength on those who are still on this side of the veil, waiting that day that we will see Zach again. In Jesus' name, amen. On behalf of the Douglas County Sheriff's Office and the family, we would like to express our sincerest appreciation for the support that you have shown for Deputy Parrish and his family. In this next sequence, we would ask for your patience. Uh, the members of the Douglas County Sheriff's Office and the Castle Rock and the Morrison Police Departments, along with the extended family, will be excused at this time to assist Zach's family in bestowing final honors. During that time, you, the members of the audience, are respectfully asked to remain in the sanctuary. In a few moments, you'll be dismissed, and when you are dismissed, we encourage you to make sure you take the opportunity to sign one of the banners that is out there to show your support for the family. So if you'll just please hold tight for a few moments, we'll be back.
There's base. I keep on the numbers. Detail. Present. Oh. Bears. Ready. Grab. Bears. Bears, haste! Forward, heart!